Hi, my name is Pat Druckenmiller. I'm the director of the University of Alaska Museum in Fairbanks, and I'm also a dinosaur paleontologist, and I work in uh, northern Alaska studying polar dinosaurs. Usually when you think about dinosaur fossils, you think about big bones like this, but some of the most exciting discoveries that we're now making um, here in Alaska concerns some of the very smallest bones and teeth of any dinosaurs ever found in North America. And what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing at one site in particular in what we call the North Slope of Alaska. Now Alaska may not be the first thing that springs to mind when you think of fossils, but in fact uh, we have a whole variety of fossils from many different ages of rock. But if you want to study dinosaur fossils, the place to go is, in particular, if you want to study bones and teeth of dinosaurs, you want to go to what we call the North Slope of Alaska. And the, Lord, the North Slope is that area between the Brooks Range um, down to the Arctic Ocean. In other words, it slopes from the Brooks Range down to the Arctic Ocean. And that's the area we call the North Slope, which is today a vast tundra plain. But underneath that frozen tundra, are rocks that were laid down during the late Cretaceous period around 70 million years ago. And one of those formations in particular is called the Prince Creek Formation. And the Prince Creek Formation, um, as it turns out, has some of the most exciting fossils concerning polar dinosaurs anywhere in the world. And in fact, the Prince Creek Formation preserves one of the most complete records of polar dinosaurs we have from either hemisphere. So based on the work of a variety of scientists over many years, we've put together a rough list of the kind of dinosaurs that we think, that we know were actually running around um, in the Arctic during the late Cretaceous period and in the Prince Creek Formation. Um, this list shows that we're presently as many as 14 different types of dinosaurs that were present in northern Alaska. Um, and of those, the four shown in red, Grunulic Kukpikensis, Pachyrhinosaurus, Perororum, Alaska Cephaliganglophi, and Nanuksaurus hoglandi, these are the four named dinosaurs that uh, we have from the Prince Creek Formation. The rest are not currently named, but all of the four named dinosaurs are unique, only found no place else in the world except the Prince Creek Formation. And that's pretty interesting because we believe that most, if not all, of the dinosaurs that lived in northern Alaska uh, in the Prince Creek Formation um, may have been unique Arctic species, unique only polar regions. In fact, so much so that we think we've named a, basically a province of dinosaurs called the Panaktat province. That's an Inupiaq Eskimo word means up north or the north slope. So what makes this formation really interesting is that during the late Cretaceous period, northern Alaska was much farther north than it is today. Not farther south, but farther north. And in fact, based on what, something we call paleo latitude, we estimate that Alaska and the area where we're collecting these fossils was as far as 80 to 85 degrees north latitude. These are the northernmost dinosaurs on planet Earth. And if you compare that latitude to um, well-known dinosaur sites at lower latitudes, like the Horseshoe Canyon Formation in Alberta, those sites were actually located below 60 degrees north, meaning there was a very long distance between these two big dinosaur loca locations. Also important is what we call the mean annual temperature, or MAT. This is simply the average annual temperature. So you take each day's temperature and you average it over the course of the year. Today for this area, this um, mean annual temperature is well below the freezing point. But during the late Cretaceous, uh, based on uh, plant fossils, we can determine that this was around 6 degrees centigrade or 41 degrees Fahrenheit, much warmer than the freezing point, of course, and that's very similar to the average annual temperature today of Juneau, Alaska, which is the capital of our state. By comparison, it was much warmer at lower latitudes, such as the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, somewhere along the, the lines of probably 15 degrees centigrade or, war or, or greater. Okay, so it was chilly. These dinosaurs lived in a cool environment. More importantly, 
these dinosaurs, because they lived at such high paleo latitudes, could not escape one fundamental fact, which is that the Earth is uh, the Earth uh, spins on a tilted axis relative to the Sun. This this tilt produces our seasons, but it also means the farther north you live, the longer and darker your winters are compared to say latitudes closer to the equator. And the same thing that's hold that holds true today was holding held true in the Cretaceous period 70 million years ago. And at about 80, 85 degrees north latitude, the dinosaurs would have had to have endured four months of continuous 24 hour winter darkness, which is a very difficult thing, if you imagine, uh, for an animal to have to endure, whether it be a mammal or a dinosaur. And in fact, the fact that dinosaurs could live up there at all was astonishing. The idea that they might have lived there year round is even more so. And in fact, it's the evidence from polar dinosaurs and their presence in the Arctic that has led people to speculate a lot of different things about what they did in the winter time. So um, there's uh, two main ideas. Hypothesis number one, well, it's a little bit too cold and dark and dreary, so you leave, you migrate, you get out of there. In order for dinosaurs to uh, migrate out of these cold, dark winter environments, they would have had to undertake an annual migration, uh, probably longer than any living uh, land vertebrate today. Probably a couple of thousand kilometers round trip in order to go far enough south to escape the dark and the cold. And then they would, of course, had to return the following summer. Alternative number two, you stay put. You don't migrate at all. You figure out how to endure these cold northern climates. Um, that may require a whole bunch of different uh, adaptations to living up there for dealing with the darkness and the cold. Many of those that we're only just now beginning to understand. But one of the other really big questions that we've had for a long time about dinosaurs living in the polar environments um, is, is one really fundamental question. Um, we know they live there, but did they reproduce there? Did they nest there? Did they lay their eggs there and raise their babies there? This is a really fundamental question that has uh, eluded science for a very long time because in order to understand these things, you need to find one of the rarest kinds of fossils in the fossil record, which are eggs, eggshell fragments, um, and baby dinosaur bones. Uh, and of course, they're all very small and small things are hard to find. And so the record of baby dinosaurs from the Arctic has been largely lacking um, until very recently. So what do we know so far about dinosaurs and reproducing in the Arctic? Well, for the most part, the best evidence we've had so far comes from a site farther south in Arctic Russia uh, at a paleo latitude of around 70 degrees north, um, and it's called the Kakanut Formation. Again, this is in um, now northeastern Siberia. It was, a it was a warmer average temperature then based on the plant fossils we know from there. But more importantly, what we've uh, what have been found from these localities are a small amount of dinosaur eggshell, and these are dinosaurs that include even things like duck-billed dinosaurs. So clearly, at slightly lower latitudes, we have good evidence that there were some ability for dinosaurs to reproduce um, at these lower latitudes. But what about the Prince Creek Formation? Well, we're here to tell you today some really exciting news, which is we actually have really great evidence that not only did dinosaurs nest in the Arctic, but many, many different species of dinosaurs nested in the Arctic. This include both plant eaters, members of this group we call Ornithischia, but also meat eaters, which are theropod dinosaurs. And in fact, we have evidence that seven different groups of dinosaurs uh, nested and reproduced in the Arctic, which is a really exciting new discovery about what dinosaurs could have done. So you can get a sense of the size of fossils we're talking about here. That's a penny, a U.S. penny, yes, with a variety of different teeth and bones of what we now recognize as being perinates of dinosaurs. Perinates are simply the, the stage of growth of an animal when they were either just about finished being embryos in the egg or had just hatched out of the egg. So that's what a perinate is. And all these little bones and teeth on that uh, single penny represent perinatal remains of these dinosaurs. 
Now, if if uh, if you're going to work in the Arctic, you've got, you've got to manage to get yourself up north, which we generally do by by aircraft and out to remote field sites where we use boats to get along um, the river court, which we use as corridors or highways. The Colville River is the main river in northern Alaska that cuts down through the Prince Creek Formation, and and so we set up boats and we travel along the river by boat, setting up camps as we go and collecting dinosaur fossils. One of the big sites that have uh, been the subject of considerable amount of excavation in the previous years is a bone bed called the Liscombe Bone Bed. And this is a site that has produced literally thousands of bones of a duck-billed dinosaur. This dinosaur we named Agrunalic Cookpicensis. And what's really interesting, uh, this, this particular bone bed primarily preserves the remains of juveniles. So juveniles are just animals that are um, moved along quite a bit in their in their growth process. So in this particular case, we think these animals were probably two to three years old, so they're nowhere near their adult size. And interestingly enough, we also have evidence for juvenile dinosaurs of two other groups in the Prince Creek Formation, uh, a small uh, pachyrhinosaurs, so a ceratopsid or a horned dinosaur, and even juvenile remains of a dromaeosaur, a meat-eating dinosaur. However, juveniles are not babies. Uh, juveniles represent a much older state of growth. But again, did the babies, were they, were they hatched there or did they migrate there? We, we don't know until now. We've discovered new bone beds in the last couple of years that are providing new evidence for baby dinosaurs. Um, one of them is called Jacob's Bed, another one is called Paul's Pearls. But these sites are thin little lenses of rock that have very small fossils in them that we excavate out, first by digging through them carefully in the field, and then by collecting all of that sediment, bringing it back to our lab, and then processing it here, as I described earlier, by picking through each of these grains of sediment from these layers, grain by grain. It's very slow work, needle in a haystack. When we collect the sediment in the field, it can be pretty miserable. It can be 33 degrees and raining, sleeting, windy, uh, very uncomfortable. When you're standing in a river, washing, basically washing dirt, using river water to pour over the sediment we've collected to, to wash away as much of the mud as possible, it's very challenging. Uh, and it's not for everybody, but I'm happy to say that the rewards uh, make it all worthwhile. But it's worth it because of the great things that we find. And one of the things we're beginning to look, find now are hundreds of little bones of what are clearly perinatal uh, remains from dinosaurs. And here I've got a couple of images, um, a tail vertebra from a meat eater and a tail vertebra from a plant eater, probably a hadrosaur. But what's remarkable is, check this out, this is the head of a pin, a head of a pin one and a half millimeters across to show you the scale of the size of these tiny little bones. So not only do we have hundreds of bones like this that are very small, small doesn't necessarily mean young, it could just be a small species, but another trick that we can use to determine if the animals were truly perinates, that they were baby dinosaurs, comes from when we take thin little sections of the bones and look at them under a microscope. And when we do that, such as this little um, limb bone from a duck-billed dinosaur, we see characteristic bone that shows very, very early states of growth. In fact, the kinds of development that we see only in bones that we know come from embryonic dinosaurs or just hatched out of the egg. So this is a great way of testing the idea that, in fact, no, these aren't just small bones. They are very, they're bones from very young individuals. So we have bones, but we also have a lot of really cool teeth. So let me just share with you sort of the process we go through in determining uh, a little bit about who these teeth uh, come from and how we determine how old they are. One of the cool, exciting discoveries we made from these new bone beds is a whole new group of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. These teeth that I'm showing you have come from a group of dinosaurs that are called leptoceratopsids. This is the first time we've ever found evidence for this group in the Arctic or from the Prince Creek Formation. And really interesting, not only do we find adult teeth, but we find very, very small uh, perinatal teeth as well. And if we take a close-up look at these teeth, they are truly tiny. Again, a millimeter and a half across at the most. 
So how, um, uh, how old of an individual does a tooth like this come from? Um, and not only, by the way, do we have teeth from the lower jaw, we have teeth from the upper jaw because they have distinctive uppers and lowers. So one of the ways we go about doing this is we compare our teeth to known embryos from elsewhere. And there's a group of dinosaurs, uh, you may have heard of one, called Protoceratops from Mongolia. And we actually have eggs and babies from within the eggs of Protoceratops. Protoceratops as an adult was about the same size as Leptoceratops from which these teeth come. And what's really interesting is we know that embryonic remains of Leptoceratops, again, these are, these are little jaws with teeth that came from the inside of a dinosaur egg, that those teeth are about two and a half millimeters across. When you compare those in size to our teeth, our teeth are actually even smaller. So we have really good reason to believe these are also um, probably embryonic remains. And I'll briefly share with you some of the teeth of other groups. Uh, we have um, teeth from this one group called Fesculosauridae. These are small plant-eating dinosaurs. And again, very small teeth. This is a small species to begin with. It's not named yet, um, but clearly very tiny little teeth from this individual. Um, we have very tiny teeth from duck-billed dinosaurs like Agrunaluk. And in fact, um, some of the teeth are uh, so small that if you're not careful when you're working with these and you sneeze, your teeth will, the teeth literally just blow away and disappear before your very eyes. We have teeth of meat eaters as well, like Troodontids. Troodon is a, um, a well-known meat-eating dinosaur that we have teeth of from the Prince Creek Formation, and here is an adult-sized tooth. But we also now are finding um, perinatal-sized teeth as well, and this is a perinate from a Troodontid, a baby Troodon from the Prince Formation. Now, not all of the teeth we found were small enough to qualify for being called a perinate. Some of them seem to be from species like this Pachyrhinosaurus. They were small, but they weren't so small they were perinates. But they were small enough to be something that we call the young of year. These are individuals that basically died or shed their teeth, in this case, within the first year of life. They're still very small, but they don't qualify for just as small as a perinate. We even have these for things like the big theropod from the North Slope, the Tyrannosaur nanuxaurus. Again, probably a young of year tooth here from the very front of the mouth called the premaxilla. So what does this all mean? Well, putting it all together, um, we have really clear evidence now that several different groups of dinosaurs nested in the Arctic. So this, uh, let's go back to our question then. What does this tell us about potentially migration? And I think one of the most telling things is that if you ask the question, did dinosaurs migrate, and you, can, you think about the size of these baby dinosaurs at the time that they were born, they were very small. And that alone makes it very difficult to believe that because of their small size that they would have been capable to have been hatched and then take part in, say, a 2,000 kilometer long migration to the south. Another issue is timing. We notice um, that, uh, as I mentioned before, that the uh, nearly half of the year was too dark and cold probably for any reproduction, meaning that dinosaurs would have necessarily been restricted to only a very brief window of reproduction in the Arctic. Unlike at lower latitudes where theoretically dinosaurs could have potentially nested year-round. What's probably most interesting about the dinosaurs that would have lived in this area, though, uh, comes from new information about incubation periods. And in a nutshell, what this means is incubation period is the time after which a dinosaur lays its eggs until the time it hatches. And we have new information from a study by my colleague Greg Erickson and his colleagues that certain types of dinosaurs, such as Protoceratops and um, larger duckbill dinosaurs, Hadrosaurids, like Hypacrosaurus, took a really long time for their eggs to hatch compared to, say, a bird today. Um, up to three months for small ceratopsians and up to six months for hadrosaurs. Now thinking about that, at our site, if a dinosaur migrated and arrived in the Prince Creek Formation, say in March, about the time that the new vegetative growth was beginning, they would have then taken a few weeks to have laid their eggs, um, and then they would have had to have done all of their reproduction before the leaf, leaf fall occurred in the fall. 
So for protoceratops, if it, in this case, leptoceratops, a similar size small ceratopsian, if it was about three months, these animals would have only begun hatching out of the eggs by about the beginning of July. And for something like a large duckbill dinosaur, it may have been as late as well into September, just before leaf fall, that those dinosaurs would have first been hatched out of the egg, leaving very, very little time for those dinosaurs then to have matured enough to have then migrated south. So we think this is really strong evidence suggesting that the dinosaurs must have been year-round residents and that these very young animals would have had to have endured and overwintered their first year in the Arctic. So that places a pretty interesting new picture on dinosaurs from the polar regions. The fact that they not only reproduce there, but because of the timing, most likely would have spent um, their entire, the entire year there and probably did not undertake long distance migrations. And then that raises questions. Okay, if they overwintered, how did they do it? Did, they hide? did some of them hibernate? What were they eating? Did they have special abilities to stay warm during the winter or other sensory capabilities we don't know about? These are the exciting questions we have left to answer. Um, so we have a lot to learn about this. We have a lot more questions to ask about how dinosaurs live there in the winter. And this is the kind of work that we continue to do. And there's going to be new and exciting discoveries, I hope, for years to come um, as we continue our field work in the far north. Thank you very much.